Doc Talk is brought to you by Multimin USA, manufacturers of Multimin 90, Sure Trace Mineral Supplementation by Timed Injection. Hi there and welcome to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. We're sure glad you joined us today. We have a great show on tap. Dr. Nels Lindberg is jo going to join me today and we're going to talk about management practices and health programs for the ranch horse. You're watching Doc Talk and we'll be back in a minute. We've been here for 42 years now. We run around 2,500 cows. Well, I bought a couple loads of cattle out of cows, black cows out of California. I notice these cows are kind of a off color, rusty color. We're going to be processing these cows in the next few days, and at that time, I will inject Multimin into them to uh, help uh, take care of their copper deficiency. I would recommend Multimin to you know, any, any cow man, and it's been effective. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. This segment is brought to you by Norbrook Laboratories, manufacturers of Normos in LA, Normectrum Plus, 1% and Poron, the practical choice for your herd. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lindberg. I'm very glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, this is Dr. Nels Lindberg, who is a veterinarian, Kansas State alumni. Yes, sir. And he is a senior partner of the Animal Medical Center in Great Bend, Kansas. And he's also a member of the Production Animal Consultation Group, which is located in multiple states, mainly Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, also Australia. Um, but this group uh, consults feedlots, cow-calf operations, dairies, and, and swine operations internationally. And, and uh, you also, through your practice in Great Bend, deal, deal a lot with ranch horses and, and horses in general. That's right. We, we do a fair amount of horse work. Yeah, I'd say. <laughs> and, and so today's show, we're going to talk about ranch horse health and, and management. And I think it's a, always a timely subject and, and it's something we can't discuss enough. But uh, in general, when you're walking out there to, to work with ranchers and, and their horses, what are some of your general thoughts or you know, general ideals? Uh, you know, we, first and foremost, we, we consider vaccinations to be probably, you know, one of the most important things you can do with these horses uh, for their own health and for, from population health and making sure they don't, you know, spread disease to, to the other horses that may be stalled next to them or maybe running with them in a pasture. Uh, but we got to make sure they, they get their vaccinations up front and uh, also, you know, talk a little bit on the biosecurity of isolating those new animals as they come into those operations. Sure, because if they're carrying something or they haven't been exposed to something that's indigenous to the herd, have an opportunity to get the antigens on board. So what are we thinking about when we, when you have a new horse come into operation? What are, what are some of the things you're doing to kind of bio, for biosecurity and quarantine? From a vaccination standpoint, we want to make sure they've got, you know, your, your core vaccines, if not a few other uh, vaccinations, but we want to make sure they've got sleeping sickness, tetanus on board. We want to make sure they've had a West Nile. We want to make sure they've had a rabies, which is, oh. is very important, oh, yeah. often overlooked in horses. Uh, and then in a, in a multiple horse setting, we want to make sure they've got a flu rhino on board. Okay. Uh, but those are the, the kind of the core vaccinations we like to see in, in multi-horse operations. How long will I quarantine a new horse from the herd? Ideally, I, I like to see horses quarantined coming in for, for two weeks. Uh, you could even go longer, you could go shorter. I really hate to go anywhere any less than 10. Uh, you go down to seven and, and you could still you know, have some disease transmission after a horse comes in. He may not be clean by day seven into that operation. Well, and the other thing is it takes seven to 14 days for antigen to be built from after vaccination. That'd be, that'd be correct, yeah, even whether it's vaccinations or natural exposure. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a great show. Glad to have you here. We're going to take a break. Thank you for watching Doc Talk. We're going to come back and talk more about ranch horse health and management with Dr. Nels Lindberg from Great Bend, Kansas. Stay tuned. This segment was brought to you by Brute Cattle Equipment, makers of the Brute Stealth Hydraulic Chute. If the chute fits, swear by it. Visit our website for more information. Dr. Dan here. Whether I'm driving up and down the roads covering the state of Kansas, or I'm getting between Riley and Manhattan for my job, I'm driving a Ford truck. I'd like you to come out and visit my friends here at Dick Edwards Ford. 
They have a truck that'll suit your needs, whether you're looking for power with a Power Stroke diesel, or if you're looking for fuel efficiency with the new EcoBoost engine, they got a truck that's just right for you. They're located two miles east of the Town Center Mall in Manhattan, Kansas, and they'll bend over backwards to help you. And I'll see you down the road. Beef producers need a practical choice when antibiotic therapy is required. More than ever, they are reaching for non-prescription Noramycin 300 LA from Norbrook. Specially formulated to produce sustained antibiotic blood levels up to four days in cattle, Noramycin 300 LA delivers economic, broad-spectrum disease management for pneumonia, shipping fever, pink eye, wound infections, and foot rot. See for yourself why Norbrook's Noramycin 300 LA is the practical choice for your herd. Here in Dallas, we're proud that our vehicles use an advanced biofuel called biodiesel. It's made from renewable resources like soybean oil, canola oil, even recycled cooking oil. This year, biodiesel will displace almost a billion gallons of fossil fuel nationwide. Our air is cleaner, our economy is stronger, and America's more energy independent. It's working here, it can work in your community. Biodiesel, America's advanced biofuel. Got cattle? Rotomix manufactures a complete line of energy efficient rotary and vertical feed mixers for feedlots, beef production, dairy, and cow calf operations. Our mixers are available with the patented Generation 2 Staggered Rotor, the industry standard for feeding wet rations that include wet distiller's grain. Made in the USA, Rotomix mixers are designed for feeding performance that American cattlemen and dairy producers have come to expect. Rotomix, proud to offer a better mix in less time using less fuel. This segment is brought to you by Rotomix, manufactured in the USA and designed for feeding performance in the feedlots, beef production, dairy, and cow-calf operations. Hi there and welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Nels Lindberg. Dr. Lindberg is the senior partner and veterinarian for Animal Medical Center in Great Bend, Kansas. He's also a member of the Production Animal Consultation Group, which is a group that consults cattle in the United States and covers one out of ten steaks that's produced here in the U.S. A good number of them, yes sir. <laughs> but when you're herding those cows and when you're working with these ranches, one of the things that Dr. Lindberg has done extensively is equine practice out here in central Kansas. And we're talking today about ranch, horse, health, and management. As we left, we were discussing vaccinations and biosecurity. We're going to pick that discussion up we're going to talk about frequency and timing of year and things like that that you're you're recommending these vaccinations. Yeah, we typically, you know, it's typically a spring shot regimen that we do the the full vaccinations that we talked about earlier is in the spring, uh, and then we move into as we get into the fall. Oftentimes, especially in those multiple horse settings, we like to get uh, that uh, fall flu rhino into them to help boost those respiratory vaccinations in them because that's a lot of times when they can pick up those respiratory bugs is in that fall, winter time. Is there a difference in vaccination uh, emphasis in that two and three year old animal versus an animal that's say seven, eight been there on the farm? There can be, but but not really. I mean, in those two and three year olds, you just want to make sure they're they're well vaccinated, well vaccinated, well immunized. Uh, before they come into the setting or as they're in it, you want to make sure you, you get them through their initial boosters as, as you know, weanlings and coming up in age. But annual vaccinations, just like the five, six, seven year olds. Cool. More information on vaccines uh, available AAEP? That'd be correct. AAEP is a great resource for really about any uh, horse health information, but they do have uh, vaccination protocols on the American Association of Equine Practitioners website. Anything else on vaccinations or biosecurity? Uh, no, I'm probably pretty good there. <laughs> <laughs> Did a good job of covering it. You know, the next topic's always huge, and we see a lot of four-colored ads and, and uh, spend a lot of money on this in ranch horses, and that's uh, parasite control or deworming those, those horses. It's very important. Yeah, it's very important. Um, you know, horses, especially if they're turned out on pasture, can pick up eggs anytime, just like the bovine animal can. Um, you know, we've typically done the, the quarterly deworming has been a, a very popular schedule. Um, sometimes twice a year uh, has been popular, but what they've really kind of been moving towards is more of a strategic deworming plan and, and actually doing fecal egg count checks and making sure that horse actually has parasites uh, before we deworm them so we can 
help fend off any sort of resistance issues that, that may be occurring uh, that we don't see or know about. Yeah, so if the animal doesn't have a parasite load, there's no need in, in uh, giving them an anti-parasiticide. No, we can save you money, uh, but also hopefully not promote resistance, which, you know, actively given dewormers routinely and often is maybe not the good thing. Well, very important topic. Um, we're going to take a break. When we come back from break, we'll go ahead and pick up a little bit on deworming, and then we're going to move into talking about teeth and feet. Sounds fantastic. Glad that you're here today. We're sure glad that you're watching Doc Talk today. We'll be back in a minute. This tip brought to you by Batrol 100 Enrofloxacin Injectable, now approved for use in controlling BRD in high-risk cattle. Batrol 100, right the first time, whether it's controlling BRD in high-risk cattle or treating BRD. Hi there, folks. Today's On the Farm tip, sponsored by Bear Animal Health, centers around the use of antibiotics. And when we use antibiotics, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we follow the label directions and use these antibiotics in, a, in an appropriate manner. Secondly, we want to make sure that we're working underneath the direction and supervision of a licensed veterinarian. It's always important to work with your veterinarian to understand the most appropriate times to use antibiotics and how we can use those antibiotics in our farm animals. Lastly, observe our withdrawal times. We want to produce a wholesome, safe food supply, so make sure you follow withdrawals. If you have a, an opportunity or think that you have a mistake with antibiotics, you can call 1-800-US-FARAD and they will help you calculate a withdrawal. That's your On the Farm tip today from Bear Animal Health, and I'll see you down the road. Hi, I'm Kevin Auctioner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Paxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern, right here on RFD TV. Join the team, the Beef Quality Assurance Team. Getting BQA certified shows you're committed to practices that produce the highest quality beef in the world. And by visiting BQA.org, you can take the online certification course at a time that fits your schedule and from the comfort of your home or office. You'll also find lots of helpful tips on improving animal health and animal handling practices. Get certified, BQA certified, because it's about doing the right thing. Visit BQA.org today and become a member of the BQA team. I'm Dennis Tebow. My wife and I, Kathy, are the owners of Wolf Creek Cattle Company. We have grown to approximately 70 bulls. I'm Reese Arnold. I'm the livestock manager at Wolf Creek Cattle Company. You know, these are not just like normal cattle. These cattle, they're hauled anywhere from, you know, 8 to 10 hours a day across the United States and asked to perform. The Multiman 90 keeps them kind of level. It maintains and balances their system. The stress level is less when, you know, when everything's right and working right, then they're working right. Close caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Hi there and welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Nels Lindberg, who's a veterinarian and the senior partner of Animal Medical Center in Great Bend, Kansas. He's also a member of the Production Animal Consultation Group that covers many cattle and dairy and swine, but you also cover a lot of horses in your practice. Yeah, yes, we do. We we like doing horse work. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to help take care of people in Central. And uh, really, we, we cover horses from quite a distance away, you know, up to three or four hours away coming into Great Bend, Kansas to have us help them with their horses. Well, that new horse facility that you all built is fantastic. It, it helps us out. It's been a <laughs> tremendous addition. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really nice. And, and so when we're, let's wrap up on deworming. And what are your thoughts on the quarterly versus twice a year and, and rotating dewormers, what are, what are some of your thoughts? I, I think you've, you've got to be rotating your warmers and you've got to be careful about your rotation and making sure you're truly rotating. I've been involved in situations where they, they tell me they're giving product A and product B and they're actually not a true rotation. So they're the same product, just different <coughs> names. So you got to make sure that the active compound um, that, you're, that you're going from, from, from the different products. Yeah, make sure it's just a true rotation. Uh, so we, and if you're doing that, uh, you know, quarterly is, is often recommended. 
Uh, I don't push that terrible hard, especially with the potential resistance factors going on out there. You know, we we're talking about deworming, or, or excuse me, doing fecals just to see if they've got parasites first before you de before you deworm them. And I, and I like that approach. But other than that, then for sure, twice twice a year. Uh, I, I do think quarterly sometimes might be too often. Spring and fall. Spring and fall for certain. Yep. Yeah. Well, great information, and, and we always recommend that you work with your local veterinarian within your region, because every, every region and different horse population is different. That's correct. Well, let's move on to teeth. Very important. you got to have them. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have them, and in horses, they continually grow. That's right. Unlike humans. That's right. And so when we get different wearing of teeth and, and they're growing, then we can get them offset or, or we need to do some correction there to, to help those horses get along. But what are some of the general signs that maybe a horse isn't doing so well as far as the its teeth? Or, or what are you doing to check teeth if you're doing an examination on that horse? From, from a sign standpoint, a clinical sign that our customers or clients might see is, you know, maybe, maybe dropping some feed, maybe carrying their head to one side. Uh, and horseback, they may be they may be fighting you, resisting you, resisting that bit a little bit if you're turning to the right or turning to the left, or if you're you know trying to collect them and, and pull them up underneath themselves. Uh, so those are some of your clinical signs. You know, when we examine them, we're looking for what we call hooks and points. And horses' teeth, they grow, if I remember right, you know, three to three three millimeters up to like seven millimeters a year. And so when they wear, their teeth are offset. And, and they're offset, and so when they wear, they, they, they produce what I call, what we call hooks and points. Those are the parts of the teeth that, that, that stick into their gums and cause ulcers and things like that and make them very uncomfortable. And you've gotta, gotta float them, which basically means uh, sanding them down, taking them down back to level. Very important for health, very important for the nutrition maintenance of those horses. Extremely important. We, uh, got to take care of it. You don't want to climb on a new horse without making sure his, his teeth are adequate, adequately prepared for a bit and, and training. Great information. When we come back, we're going to wrap up with Dr. Lindbergh talking about ranch horse health and maintenance. You're watching Doc Talk, and we're sure glad you joined us. This segment is brought to you by Lalaman Animal Nutrition, dedicated to the development and production of natural and differential solutions for animal nutrition. This is Agriculture Today from Kansas State University. Well, after over a decade of research, K-State animal scientists have discovered that by feeding a specific grain to feedlot cattle, the beef from those cattle ends up with a high content of a highly desirable human nutrient, that is, omega-3 fatty acids. Here's K-State feedlot scientist Jim Druyard. We alter their diet, so we incorporate ingredients into the diet that themselves contain omega-3 fatty acids, um, such as flaxseed. That's a very rich source of omega-3 fatty acids. And so uh, adding 5 to 10 percent flaxseed to the diet, uh, we can get maybe a, a 10 or 12-fold increase in the omega-3 content of the beef. This is K-State Research and Extension. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine is a leader in food animal research and education. Our researchers are constantly expanding the knowledge of animal health and food safety. Through the Veterinary Health Center and the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, we provide practical services for animal producers. Home of the Beef Cattle Institute, the college is committed to animal welfare training and research. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, knowledge and service for the future of animal production. Cow-calf, stalker, and feedlot producers know that effective parasite control improves overall herd performance and profitability. Norbrook offers a comprehensive, economical line of boron and injectable parasiticides for every livestock operation. Consult with your local animal health supplier to set up a program that protects your investment and brings larger cattle checks this fall. See for yourself why the Noromectin line from Norbrook is the practical choice for your herd. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. This segment is brought to you by the Graham School for Cattlemen with over 100 years of continuous service to the cattle industry. To find out more, visit us online at grahamschool.com. Hi folks and welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Nels Lindbergh, who's a veterinarian and senior partner in the Animal Medical Center at Great Bend, Kansas. 
and a member of Production Animal Consultation. And we're talking about ranch horse health and management. And when we left, we're talking about teeth. And how often are, are you recommend we, we check these teeth or, or taking a look at them? Oh, we need, we need to look at those teeth, you know, once a year is kind of our typical recommendation whether we actually decide to float them or not, but uh, you, need to, you need to get into their mouth, uh, either or you or your veterinarian, and get a good look in there and make sure there's nothing we don't need to take care of. Okay, let's move from the mouth down to the ground, and let's talk about hooves and, and foot care, and something that's vitally important, of course, to something, uh, you know, performance animals like, well, like ranch horses. That's correct. Uh, the, the feet is the feet are their their foundation, and uh, if there's an issue with it, they, they come up sore, lame, whatever it might be. And and if you have a lame horse, you can't you can't ride that horse. And we, we need to to be able to perform for us to do their job, whatever it might be. Just like an athlete, Just, no wheels, no performance. That's right. That's right. When we're, what are some of the more important things or more common causes of lameness in these ranch horses? Oh, I mean, some of your basic things are sole bruises, uh, where they may step on a rock or something and cause a bruise uh, that can then lead into to sole abscesses or sole subsolar abscesses. Mm -hmm. uh, all the way to, to, as those horses get older, you can have some navicular issues and that navicular bone from, from the repeated stress that those feet, you know, just pound on them all day. Uh, to coffin bone issues and and to some things like founder where they you know they may eat too much of a certain grain and, and founder. Prevention's the key. Prevention's the key. You know you need to you need to be dealing with a farrier or or getting those horses trimmed and or shod on a routine basis and you know getting on a schedule with a farrier is is very important and, and it can be hard to do that. There's sometimes not enough farriers to go around, but uh, getting on a schedule for good routine. Uh, hoof care maintenance on a horse is, is a must. <laughs> One of the things you said that you guys are offering now is uh, chiropractic treatments for equine? That's correct. Uh, Dr. Matt Fair, uh, my partner, he, uh, he d takes care of the chiropractics and it's, it's a part of our business that has really exploded. Uh, as I tell people, you, you know, you've got 1,100 pound horse and, and we ask them to run you know, 20, 30 miles an hour, and we ask them to stop on a dime. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of things that happen, whether it's in their legs or in their spine, but they're, you know, they're just a large athlete, 1,100 pound athlete. There's a lot of torque, there's a lot of compression that's going on in that spine, and, and it's, you know, they're, they're gonna have spinal issues. And uh, going to a great chiropractor uh, sure can help resolve some of those issues. Well, you guys do a great job at Animal Medical Center. Really glad you took time to, to be with us here on the show. I'm very glad to be here. Appreciate all you do for Kansas State University, and we appreciate you watching this show. If you want to know more about what we do at Kansas State University at the College of Veterinary Medicine, you can find us on the web at www.vet.ksu.edu. Remember, always work with your local practitioner. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson from Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. You've been watching Doc Talk. I'm sure glad you joined us, and I'll see you down the road. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. Doc Talk was brought to you by Multimin USA, manufacturers of Multimin 90, sure trace mineral supplementation by timed injection. Well, the Kansas State University cow-calf herd has to be run as a business. Uh, we have to uh, have positive cash flow in order to exist. So treatment costs are important to us. Multimin 90 was, was applied to the cows um, 107 days before the first predicted calving date, and then again approximately 30 days before the anticipated start of the breeding season. In our study, treatment costs with Multimin 90 costs an additional $6.40 per cow. That included both injections. Now, a question a producer might ask is how much extra performance on a cow or a calf do I need to capture to pay for that $6.40? Well, historically, the value of gain in a calf has been worth um, right around $0.65 cents a pound. If a calf is born approximately five days earlier, it will gain, it will be 10 pounds heavier at weaning time. Now in our study, with the shift in calving distribution that we saw further forward in the season, 
In other words, we had a greater proportion of calves born early in the season and treated females as opposed to untreated females, we would have more than captured uh, the value of the product that we applied. In our study, 77% of the treated females gave birth in the first 20 days of the calving season. Untreated females, uh, only 64% of the animals gave birth in the first 20 days of the season. In other words, we had 13% more calves born early in the season. The opportunity for them to, uh, uh, to be heavier at weaning uh, was, was greater among the treated females simply because those calves were older. Their mothers conceived earlier, they gave birth earlier. Um, for every day that a calf spends suckling its mother, it's gonna gain about 2.2 pounds. In causing those calves to be born earlier in the year, they would have had greater opportunity to accrue body weight prior to weaning time.